Okay, so here we are, lesson number 46 in our series on Genesis, the foundation book of the Bible. And uh, today we'll be talking about uh, chapter 42 uh, in Genesis, so you can go there. I'll be flashing the uh, scriptures up on the screen as well. And the title of our lesson today is Confrontation. Now we're nearing the end of our series on Genesis with the uh, transitional story of Joseph. Aside from the kind of up close view of this man and his response to trials and sufferings, as well as his incredible success and blessings, this story also serves as a bridge linking the movement of Jacob's family from Canaan to Egypt. It tells the story. You know, when we go into the next book of the Bible, uh, that book begins with the uh, Israelites in Egypt. So the story of, jo uh, of Jacob, kind of, uh, of Joseph rather, gives this uh, transitional uh, movement. So far, we've seen Joseph uh, wrongly accused and imprisoned and then released in order to give uh, dream interpretations to Pharaoh. The Pharaoh dreams uh, his dreams, rather, uh, predicted that Egypt would have a cycle of seven abundant years followed by seven years of famine. And of course, Joseph correctly interprets uh, those dreams. As uh, for his reward for correctly interpreting the dreams, the king makes Joseph the second in command in the country and charges him to carry out uh, the plan to establish um, basically a system of storage plants. You know, they collect so much harvest uh, each year and a percentage of that harvest is uh, placed into these storage plants you know, in preparation for the famine. Now in the next couple of chapters we're going to read of the story of Joseph's confrontation with his brothers as they, during the period of famine, journey to Egypt to purchase grain uh, that has been stored there by, well unknowingly to them, but by their brother Joseph. So the scene of uh, the writers, uh, the writers uh, now revert back to Canaan with Jacob and the brothers of Joseph. You know, when we left off, we left off with Joseph interpreting the dream, taking over, so on and so forth. Now the scene shifts back to Canaan uh, with uh, Jacob's family. 20 years goes by since the uh, deception, um, 13 years uh, in Potiphar's house and in jail, seven years supervising the grain storage. Jacob is still alive and leading his family, and the 11 brothers remain with their awful secret that they have now kept for 20 years. So let's go to chapter 42 and begin reading. It says, Now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, and Jacob said to his sons, Why are you staring at one another? He said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some food for us uh, from that place so that we may live and not die. Then 10 brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he, says, he said, I am afraid that harm may befall him. So of course, as Joseph had uh, uh, mentioned, uh, the famine spreads beyond Egypt to where Jacob and his sons are living in Canaan. Um, others, other countries, other people were going down to buy grain uh, from Egypt, but Jacob's sons were reluctant to journey towards that country. I mean, they were afraid of going to where they had sent Joseph. You know, maybe they'd meet him or meet some kind of similar fate. So you know, a guilty conscience makes you kind of wary, doesn't it? So they're wary to go to Egypt. Jacob, of course, pushes them to go. Uh, obviously, in those days, you couldn't send slaves because slaves would not be received uh, by the Egyptians. Uh, but he doesn't send Benjamin, his youngest son, either. He sends the other 10. You know, the last time he sent one of Rachel's sons, he disappeared. So he's not going to take any chances with his only remaining child of the woman that he loved first. So the story continues, verse five. So the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those who were coming, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the ruler over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to him with their faces 
to the ground. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he disguised himself to them and spoke to them harshly. And he said to them, where have you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. But Joseph had recognized his brothers, although they did not recognize him. Joseph remembered the dreams which he had about them and said to them, you are spies. You have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. So there were many caravans of food buying missions and apparently each were screened by Joseph to make sure of two things. One, uh, probably the amount, of, the amount of grain sold would not undermine their own personal supplies. I mean, first and foremost, they had to protect the people of Egypt. And so he was controlling the amount that he was you know, allowing other, other missions, other places to purchase. And secondly, he was probably watching for foreign invaders, envious of uh, Egypt's wealth, uh, perhaps trying to infiltrate in order to topple the country, seize the grain. So Joseph acted like the chief of immigration, or the CIA, if you wish, to screen all those who were coming and going. So the brothers don't recognize him. Let's face it, he left when he was 17 years old. Now he's about 37 or 38 years old, dressed like an Egyptian ruler. I mean, you know, they can't even imagine what he might look like at this time. He recognizes them. He may have even anticipated their coming. Um, but he purposefully uses an interpreter and speaks harshly to them to, to throw them off balance. And he's, he's got a, a plan, you'll see as the story develops, um, how he is thinking, you know, the reason he's doing this in order to gain information. He even accuses them of spying. So as they bow down to him in submission and in respect for a great Egyptian you know, uh, official, he is reminded of his dream as a young man and how God has made this dream of reality. Uh, now, of course, it's not a question of vanity as it was when he was a young man. You know, look at me, I had a dream, you people were bowing down to me. It's no longer that. It's an example of God's great power that he, he sees and he, he understands. So let's keep reading. In verse 10, then they said to him, No, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. Yet he said to them, No, but you have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. But they said, Your servants are twelve brothers in all, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no longer alive. Joseph said to them, it is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you will be tested. By the life of Pharaoh you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you that he may get your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested, whether there is truth in you. But if not, by the life of Pharaoh surely you are spies. So he put them all together in prison for three days. So Joseph continues to kind of pump information from them by his accusations. Their defense is that they're all brothers. You know, the idea is that no king would send 10 brothers to spy, especially his own sons. He wouldn't risk his own sons in such a dangerous mission. They also mentioned Benjamin at home, who was Joseph's full and natural brother, as well as Joseph himself saying that, well, we have one brother who is dead. Joseph now knows that his brothers and father are all alive. All the family is intact, the way it was when he left it 20 years before. So he's managed to pull some information from them without them becoming suspicious of what, he, you know, what he's doing. So um, he continues to accuse them of spying and he puts them in jail, demanding that they produce their younger brother in order to prove the story. So their time in jail with the possibility of remaining there indefinitely may have seemed like a proper justice for what they had done uh, to Joseph. Now he's got them thinking. So we keep going, verse 18. It says, Now Joseph said to them on the third day, Do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined in your prison. But as for the rest of you, go carry grain for the famine of your households and bring your youngest brother to me so your words may be verified and you will not die. And they did so. Then 
they said to one another, truly we are guilty concerning our brother because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore this distress has come upon us. Reuben answered them saying, did I not tell you, do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? Now comes the reckoning for his blood. They did not know, however, that Joseph understood, for there was an interpreter between them. He turned away from them and wept, but when he returned to them and spoke to them, he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to restore every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey, and thus it was done for them. So, an interesting episode here, you know, as the brothers are released from prison and Joseph requires only one of them to remain as hostage. Now, they discuss their sin against Joseph, thinking that God was now punishing them uh, and it was an appropriate way, right? They, they sent him off to slavery, to some sort of prison, to enslavement, and now God is putting them in prison, if you wish, and denying them returning home. Another thing that's interesting about this particular passage it's, is, is that it's the only time in the book of Genesis where sinners actually acknowledge their guilt and the responsibility for their sins. Of all the characters here who are guilty of sin that we read about from Adam all the way now to Joseph, this is the only time one of those individuals acknowledges their sin. Anyways, uh, continuing with our story, Joseph uh, as we know, can understand their conversations, but they don't realize because he was speaking through an interpreter. Now, Reuben defends some of his actions, but he says this is God's punishment, which they deserve. So they can go home, but they need to leave one person behind. And if they return, they must bring Benjamin with them. That's the deal, that's, that's, that's what has to happen. So let's read verses um, uh, 24. Uh, 25, 26 here, verse 24, he says, He turned away from them and wept. But when he returned to them and spoke to them, he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to restore every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. And thus it was done for them. So they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed from there. So, as I said, Joseph overhears their acknowledgement of sin and uh, their resignation to receive the punishment. You know, they're saying, look, we're being punished and we deserve it because of what we did to our, our brother. And of course, Joseph, in hearing this, is overcome with grief and joy and emotion. You know, all of that bottled up for 20 years. You know, imagine the emotions that he's feeling, angry and resentful at their treatment of him and then joy for actually seeing his family again, and then relief that through their confession, through their acknowledgement of sin, somehow their souls will be saved, because Joseph was also a spiritual man. Now he keeps Simeon as hostage, and there's probably a good reason for this. Reuben, the oldest, was not responsible for the act because he, he tried to stop them. Simeon was the second oldest, uh, he had a violent nature. I mean, he was the one who killed all those who raped Dinah. And he was probably the leader in the affair you know, to, to, uh, uh, to, get rid of, uh, to get rid of Joseph. So keeping Simeon must have had an impact on the others and Simeon himself, who knew full well his responsibility for the affair. So let's continue reading a little longer passage here, verse 27 down to 38 says, as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money, and behold, it was in the mouth of a sack. Then he said to his brothers, My money has been returned, and behold, it is even in my sack. And their hearts sank, and they turned trembling to one another, saying, What is this that God has done to us? When they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man, the Lord of the land, spoke harshly with us and took us for spies of the country. But we said to him, we are honest men, we are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no longer alive, and the youngest is with our father today in the land of Canaan. The man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me, and take grain for the famine of your household, and go. But bring your youngest brother to me, that I may know that you are not spies, but honest men. I will give your brother to you, and you may trade in the land. 
Now it came about as they were emptying their sacks that behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were dismayed. Their father Jacob said to them, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more. And you would take Benjamin, all these things are against me. Then Reuben spoke to his father saying, you may put my two sons to death if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my care and I will return him to you. But Jacob said, my son shall not go down with you for his brother is dead and he alone is left. If harm should befall him on the journey you are taking, then you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. Uh, so let's stop right there, okay? Let's kind of discuss that for a second. So at the beginning, they only thought one bag of money was with their grain, but upon returning home, they discovered that all the money was with the grain, opening them up to theft charges when they return. A lot of problems, right? Of course, Joseph knew that they would return, not only for Simeon, but he knew that the famine would go on and on and they would have to return, so he had that information. Now Jacob accuses them, unbeknowingly, of losing two of his sons and declares that if he loses Benjamin too, all will be lost as far as he's concerned. And he, of course, is thinking also about God's promise and its fulfillment through his sons. Now Reuben shows some character, some leadership here, by promising to bring everyone back safely and he promises this on the heads of his children. But Jacob refuses and the matter remains this way, you know, the way it is for a while, no decision. Now I want you to notice that neither of the boys, Jacob or even Reuben in his oath, none of them go to God for help or direction. You don't see anywhere in this narrative that they stopped and they prayed or they fasted and prayed to God and they called out to God for help or direct, none of that here. All they do is worry and argue and stress with one another. No prayer involved. So now we go to the second trip to Egypt in chapter, uh, 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 chapter 43. Uh, Simeon, of course, is languishing in the Egyptian jail and the family in Canaan is paralyzed by fear of what will happen to them if they, if they return. So everything is in a stalemate until God breaks the tie. So let's read verses one to five. It says, now the famine was severe in the land. So it came about when they had finished eating the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, go back, buy us a little food. Judah spoke to him, however, saying, the man solemnly warned us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you do not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you will not see my face unless your brother is with you. So as Joseph predicted, the famine, the famine rather perseveres and um, you know, their hope of kind of, you know, they were trying to ride out the famine. Let's just ride out the famine. I think somehow they were thinking, we'll ride out the famine, we'll you know, maybe Simeon, we'll leave Simeon there. You know, kind of cost of doing business, if you wish but they can't ride this, the famine out. They have to go back. That's the only place where they can get food. They need to take action. We note here, of course, the ascendancy of Judah into a leadership position in that family. Uh, Reuben, the eldest, he had good intentions, but he was weak-willed and he was fearful. Didn't offer his life, he offered the life of his children. Uh, Simeon, of course, was decisive, but he was a violent man and he was hard-hearted. I mean, he was the one who refused to hear Joseph's appeal for mercy when, when he was in the, in the well. Uh, Levi also was violent and quick-tempered, not, not things that you want in a, a leader. And so this left the opening for Judah to demonstrate some caring and courageous leadership. And we know that it's through Judah's line that eventually the Messiah, Jesus, would come. So let's pick up the story in verse six. It says, then Israel said, why did you treat me so badly by telling the man whether you still had another brother? But they said, the man questioned particularly about us and our relatives saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? So we answered his questions. Could we possibly know that he would say, bring your brother down? 
Judah said to his father Israel, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, we as well as you and our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. You may hold me responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame before you forever. For if we had not delayed, surely by now we could have returned twice. So Jacob argues with his sons, you know, some uh, you know, a little bit more, but Judah finally convinces him of the need to return with Benjamin. And I want you to note some changes that are taking place here uh, in, in Jacob. First of all, the Bible begins to refer to Jacob as Israel again. Not since the death of Joseph and Jacob's depression and loss of faith had he been referred to by his God-given name. His original name was Jacob, but his God-given name was Israel. And so after Joseph died, all, all, all references to him use his old name as, as a signal, if you wish, signifying his, I wouldn't say his worldliness, but the idea that he wasn't growing spiritually uh, anymore because of the death of his son or the perceived death of his son. Now that his faith is reviving and he is forced to trust in God, he's referred to by his divinely appointed name, Israel. I want you also to note the great parallel here between Judah's plan and his offer and the ultimate plan and offer of the Savior who would come through Judah's genealogy. A, a, a type, okay, a type. Remember all, when we talk about types, they're like previews of things. Here's a type, we see a type here. Judah was offering himself as a ransom for the safety of the others if anything went wrong. Just like Jesus offers himself for everything that has gone wrong in our lives. A, a type, a parallel, a preview of uh, uh, not only a person, but a preview of the gospel itself, how God would save uh, mankind. So the point is that if there was trouble, one person, uh, Judah, would have to pay. And Judah was willing to offer himself as the payment in order to save his family. Now, there's the perfect parallel, isn't there, for the gospel itself, for Jesus. Because Jesus, of course, is perfect and eternal, his sacrifice pays not only for one family or one person, but his sacrifice pays for everybody, and it pays the debt forever and ever and ever. So we continue reading in verse 11. It says, Then their father Israel said to them, if, I must, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best products of the land in your bags and carry down to the man as a present, a little balm and a little honey, aromatic gum and myrrh, pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double the money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps, it was a mistake. Take your brother also and arise, return to the man, and may God Almighty grant you compassion in the sight of the man, so that he will release to you your brother, your other brother, and Benjamin. And as for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So Israel's faith is rekindled again. He prepares gifts to appease the Egyptian Lord, like he had done you know, for Esau in the past. He doubles the money to pay back what they owed. You know, uh, what's interesting too is they, they sold Joseph for 20 pieces of silver, now they return to Egypt with 20 bundles of silver too, you know, for each of the 10 uh, brothers. And then of course, Israel accepts the fact that the matter is now in God's hands. You know, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. In other words, let God's will be done, I'm ready to accept whatever is going to take place. So through this experience, God is ministering to everybody in the family concerning trust and repentance and leadership and faith. It's amazing what God does you know, through, uh, through our um, uh, experiences in life, the things that He teaches us and He uh, helps us to understand and grow. All right, well, verses 15 down to 23, a long section simply describing their return and their reunion with Joseph. And I'll just summarize that. They, they still don't know who he is, but when Joseph sees Benjamin, 
he's assured that a reconciliation is actually possible because they were not lying about his brother. The point was they hadn't killed him too. See, in his mind he's saying, well, they got rid of me because you know, there's just me and my brother, Benjamin, from our mother, uh, Rachel. See what I'm saying? So now he's sure that they haven't gotten rid of his brother. He sees his brother in person. The brothers are invited to eat with Joseph and Simeon, who has now been released from prison. And they're still suspicious, thinking that Joseph, you know, he just wants to lure them into a trap in order to rob them or to hurt them for some reason. There's also a section that describes how Joseph's servant tells them that their God has placed the money in their sacks and there was nothing to worry about. And an interesting little sidelight that demonstrates that Joseph must have converted the slave. But the brothers were so fearful and confused that they, they didn't even notice that. You know, the, the slave is talking about the God that, they, that they're supposed to worship. So we pick up the story in verse 24. It says, Then the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, and they washed their feet, and he gave their donkeys fodder. Uh, so they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they had heard they were to eat a uh, meal there. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present which was in their hand and bowed to the ground before him. Then he asked them about their welfare and said, Is your old father well, of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? They said, Your servant our father is well, he is still alive. They bowed down in homage. As he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, he said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, May God be gracious to you, my son. Joseph hurried out, for he was deeply stirred over his brother, and he sought a place to weep, and he entered his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out, and he controlled himself and said, and said Serve them. So Joseph gets more information from them. He receives their gifts and respect, but he loses it you know, when he sees his younger brother. You know, uh, it's such a beautiful passage. Isn't that so human? I mean, thousands of years ago, this episode took place, and yet all of us can, can easily relate to finding someone that we thought we had lost forever. The emotion of it just overwhelms him. And after weeping by himself, he begins the meal. So let's finish up the story. It says, Joseph hurried out, for he was deeply stirred over his brother, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there. And then he washed his face and came out. He controlled himself and said, serve the meal. I think we read that one before. And he took portions uh, to them from his own table. But Gen uh, 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 Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. So they feasted and drank freely with him. And there's a little passage here that I, I want to read. I think I didn't get it in the, uh, in the overhead here. Let's go back. It says um, in verse 32, okay, let's read verse 32 again. It says, so they served him by himself, meaning Joseph, and them by themselves, meaning the, uh, the brothers, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is loathsome to the Egyptians. Now they were seated before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in astonishment. Then, verse 34, what we just read, he took portions to them from his own table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs, so they feasted and drank freely with him. So there's the complete passage from 31, 32, 33, 34, the last verse of that particular chapter. Some interesting things here that we see. Egyptians, of course, by custom, uh, were racially exclusive. There were three tables, one for the Hebrews, one for the Egyptians and their guests, and then one for Joseph himself. Now the other thing is he, he had set them up at the table according to age, the youngest down to the, uh, excuse me, the eldest down to the youngest. And the odds of getting the 11 of them in the right numerical order, uh, some have calculated 40 million to one. So they, I don't know if they knew it was 40 million to one, but they, they were amazed that he, he guessed correctly you know, the order of ages in the way that they were sat. Another interesting point is the extra food here. It says extra food, he was given five times as much. You know. 
Well, this was not five times as much food. It's not like he had five chicken legs and you know, if one had two chicken legs, you know, Benjamin got 10 chicken legs, you know, five times as much. Um, it, it actually meant five times more often was a special food taster from Joseph's table sent to him to offer him something as a way of honoring, you know, that's what they did. You know, from, the, from the table of the king or the lord or whatever, he would send one of his food tasters to one of the guests to offer him something to try and so on and so forth. It was a way of honoring that particular individual. So uh, Joseph was honoring Benjamin uh, okay, more than uh, his, other, uh, his other guests. So what, uh, what had begun this entire affair was these brothers' jealousy and resentment of Joseph, their half-brother. That's what started this whole thing, right? They, they were jealous of him, they, they tried to kill him, and then finally they sold him into slavery. Now, in this situation, Joseph, by honoring Benjamin, wanted to see if any of that resentment and jealousy remained, and it would have been obvious. But the Bible says that they enjoyed their meal with happiness, so obviously they were not bothered by Joseph's kindness to uh, Benjamin. All right, so we're going to stop there. Next time we're going to talk about the, uh, the great reunion that they had and the reconciliation. So many great lessons that we can draw from this particular um, story, the part of this story, and I'd like to share a couple of them with you. First of all, always know that sin will find you out eventually. Whatever your sin is, eventually it'll come out. You know, how could these men think that with God watching, they could commit this sin and it would go unnoticed and unpunished? How could they even think such a thing? So you know, it's a good lesson for us. We, we need to avoid sin because it will always come to light. I mean, we need to avoid sin because sin condemns us and destroys us. But aside from that, it always comes to light. And when we do sin and we know we have sin, we need to be able to deal with it by asking for forgiveness and doing the right thing before either we're embarrassed by it or we're judged and condemned for it. I want you to note how their prosperity and their faith diminished as they hid their sin for 20 years and, and they were judged. They were judged for it. Second lesson, no pain, no gain, right? No pain, no gain. You know, bad is bad. Pain hurts. Death brings grief. But sometimes out of these comes some good. Not always, but sometimes. You know, we should do all we can, of course, to alleviate pain and avoid evil and you know, process our grief. But sometimes, again, not always, but sometimes the negative things are necessary to produce positive things. And I say this because sometimes people think that you know, something good always comes out of something bad. Well, not necessarily. Sometimes something bad happens and the best, the only thing that comes out of it is that it changes our life somehow. And it's hard to find the good. You, know, you lose a leg. You know, to, you know, an accident, they amputate your leg. Well, you know, your life's going to be different. Maybe the only good thing is, you know, okay, well, maybe you learn patience or tolerance for other people's pain and so on and so forth. But you know, the sum total is not always better than what you had before. No pain, no gain, that idea um, you know, that old idea for workout, you know, studios, exercise, you know, if you want to grow, you've got to go through some pain. Well, that general idea is true for spiritual growth many times. There is often a necessary period of pain in order to produce a new direction or a new dimension or a new, de a new, de a new element of spirituality in our lives. Like I say, not every bad thing that happens to us produces something great that overwhelms all the bad, no. But in spiritual development, many times you know, there's discomfort, there's changes we have to face, sometimes emotional or even physical pain that needs to take place in order for us to gain that spiritual insight or to gain that spiritual growth. And of course, this is what happened to, to Joseph. Uh, another good lesson, Leaders carry the heavy end. Leaders carry the heavy end. Judah only gained leadership 
in the family when he was willing to offer not his children, like Reuben said. Reuben said, if I don't come back, you, know, you can have my children. But Judah offered himself. Well, leaders in every area of the church, uh, or, or even in, in the home, or in business, or in politics, these leaders are leaders because they are willing to make the tough decisions or to do the dirty jobs or to maintain a heavy load of responsibility while remaining faithful and loving and kind. You know, the reason that we give leaders honor and we pray for them and we give them respect and obedience is because they are willing and able to carry a heavier load than we are especially in the church, because leadership roles in the church are all voluntary. Nobody gets paid extra. There are no, quote, extra perks for being a, a deacon or for being a, a, an elder. It just means more work, more responsibility. Uh, what the church gives to these people are not necessarily money or anything like that, but we do give them our respect and we do give them our love and we do offer our prayers on their, on their behalf because leaders, leaders carry the heavy end. Of the, of, the, of the burden. And then maybe a bonus, usually I give three, so I'll give an extra one. Number four, do all you can and leave all the rest to God. You know, Jacob gave a great example of a living and working faith. He, he used all of his available resources to influence the outcome, but he recognized and accepted that the final outcome, it rested with God and not him. In the end, he had to accept whatever's going to happen is going to happen, right? He tried to massage the situation, didn't work. So we need to find that balance as well in our, in our lives. Not simply wait for signs you know, or coincidences. You know, I'm waiting for a sign from God. Well, you might be waiting a long time. Not just wait for things like that. Not think that we can do it all. That's the opposite. Some people don't do anything. They're waiting for a definite sign. You know, other people think they have to do everything. I think the truth of the matter is somewhere in the middle. You know, we need to act in a way where we use our God-given talents and resources to do our very best and trust that God will bless us and use us to accomplish not our will, use us to accomplish His will. You know, I'm the most joyful in my spiritual life, in my ministry life, when I can actually observe God accomplishing His will in somebody else's life using something that I may have contributed. That's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Perhaps the only better feeling is when I see how God is using the talent and skills of a lot of people working together to accomplish His perfect will. This is a marvelous reward and something we all should be looking towards um, in offering our service and our resources and our talents to God. Okay, so that's the confrontation. Uh, we're almost at the end, 50 lessons, God willing, we'll be finished in a couple of weeks. Next week we're going to review and continue the story of Joseph and this time as the reconciliation with his brothers uh, continues uh, uh, to uh, go forward. All right, we'll see you next time. Thanks for your attention.